Hello, and welcome back to the Trench Love Podcast. This week we're joined by Dirt Monkey. Um, it's a fucking great episode. Sadly, we did have some technical issues when we were recording, which we always seem to do, but it still ended up being a really good episode. We had lots of good chats and played some new music from my new album. So yeah, hope you guys enjoy it. Sweet, well, welcome to Trench Love Podcast, episode five of season two. We are joined by Dirt Monkey today. Hello, sir. Hey. And Aiden, of course. Hey. <laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah, it's nice to finally catch up, dude. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's like the first time we've actually talked in person. Yeah, so to speak. Kind of hilarious. Yeah, it seems to have been like it's. I don't know. I've not we've not known each other very long, but the world has been there, uh, going on quite the journey since we met. Yeah. That's a bit of an understatement. Yeah, yeah. What what a time to meet, what a time to meet and start working together when the whole world is falling apart. I mean, to be fair, like the album's coming out, or as the podcast comes out, it'll probably be out. Um, and you've managed to do it during coronavirus, so fair play. <laughs> I don't think it would have existed if it wasn't for all this shit happening. To be honest. Yeah. yeah. Um, on lockdown, of course, to write a bunch of music. Yeah, man. I mean, I think now that um, now that lockdown's kind of settled in a bit more, I'm kind of actually just busy doing other bullshit but when it first started i just had all this free time that suddenly opened up and just just making other music it's not quite as easy now but yeah yeah i think i feel like the beginning too it was more of like i think we were all panicking and being like i have to stay relevant i don't know if i'm ever gonna (laughs) see a show again music as possible yeah, it was kind of a bit of a, a honeymoon phase there for a bit as well it was like <laughs> it was actually quite nice like looking back on that time now it's like but now it just now it's a bit more real isn't it but then it was just like a nice little day off <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah shit got real pretty fast yeah so um yeah should we, should we crack, crack things off Aiden do you want to start yeah well um uh, I mean one thing we wanted to know so I mean we know this but uh, all our guys don't so Patrick how did you uh how did you first discover Will how did you uh, hear about the Father Funk? I just in my Facebook group, the Banana Bun, she like posted a video and he's like, hey, check out this song I made. And I was like, hey, we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, I think um, making that track was, was kind of, I don't know. I don't think I even meant to. I think I always had you in mind because I've, I've been obviously listening to your shit for a while. and then, But yeah, I think it was kind of a bit of a spur of the moment decision to post it in there. I didn't really expect it to do so well. It's got you got a cool community going in there, man. Yeah, it's a good group. I love it. Everyone's pretty level headed for the most yeah. part. Yeah, our Church of Love group's great, but it's mostly just pretty blasphemous memes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like, way too many memes. Like everyone just like every day I look at it and it's just like it's just so much horrible shit. That's funny. <laughs> but it's just so horrible. It's like <laughs> Yeah, I try, I try and post like a new song and it gets like one like, and then someone posts like the most disgusting blasphemous Jesus meme you've ever seen, and it's like fifty likes. <laughs> That's just the internet right there. You just described the internet as a whole. Yeah, I was thinking. I was thinking about that. Like, same with um, Preston Sub Doctor's group is all just dog memes as well. It's, like, <laughs> it's quite hard to make a group that isn't just to descend into internetness. Oh, mine's all banana <laughs> memes. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Slinks yeah. is all mayonnaise memes. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, I guess we should probably start with some music, hey? Yeah, man. Um, should we have uh, Funk Step since that's the track that I did send you in the first place? I think and that's the t- title track of the album. It's about to start. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, I guess that, like, like like we were just saying, I sent that to the Banana Bunch, and that's how Patrick got in touch. And then from that, it kind of spawned the whole album, which came together pretty quick. So um, yeah, I went from like, "Hey, let's put this song out," to, "Oh, let's write a song together." Oh, let's make it an EP. Oh, how about you just want to do an album? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, escalated very quick. Yeah, sweet. That's how it. All right, you can go ahead and start.
That was my track Funk Step from my album Funk Step, which is probably out by the time this comes out. Who knows? It depends how fast I can edit this. <laughs> um, yeah, it's sick, man. So um, what, what, what's that studio you're in there, Patrick? Is that, is that the one that Mr. Bill used to be in? Yeah. Yeah, this is his old studio. Cool. How long have you been in there? Um, I've been here since, I think since January. Cool. Yeah, I moved in here. Yeah, because he moved to San Francisco and then I, I took over. Nice. Yeah, that's like a cool, cool spot. It's sick. Yeah, it's treated really well. I can get, I can actually like write better music in here because it's just, I'm like not distracted by anything. Yeah, you can, you can get there and it's like the space. You're in the zone. It's just like away from everything else. Yeah. It's so yeah, it's quite hard living in this, living in my production spaces. Like I constantly feel guilty for like not making music if I'm like in my room or, oh, or yeah. I just can't switch off, you know? Or you're like, shit, I gotta do laundry. Okay, I'm gonna- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> yeah, totally. I think it makes such a big difference having a treated room as well. Like of all of all the things I could t- I could sort of s- recommend to producers for getting a good mix down, it's all about the room and the listening environment. Like oh, all, top, all the that's the top thing. Yeah, totally. All, all all the tunes that I made when I was I studied at music college, and all the tracks that I made there that I mixed down there, even though. Most of the shit I made at that time was pretty garbage. It still all sounds pretty good in terms of like if you play it out, it, like the balance of everything is great just because it was mixed down in a proper studio. Like it's not that, not that I used a fancy desk. It just sounded right, you know? Yeah, we, mm. we, we've got a mattress here behind me in the Ruatiri <laughs> studio. <laughs> that, that's our sound treatment. <laughs> nice. Hey, I'd say anything you can get on the walls is good. Better than nothing, you know? No, totally. I think my, having my, my clothing rail just here probably helps as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah cool, I that's, um, that's, that's doing a pretty good job. I got a bike, too. That's that's some sound treatment for today. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Sweet. So, yeah, we, we've been trying to get into a bit more of like an interview vibe with the podcast recently. Like the last the last series, we kind of just talked shit with people. But yeah, <laughs> trying to have a little bit, trying to um, have a bit more structure this time. So, um, yeah, I've got a, few, got a few questions here that I've written down. Um, and start. I just start start off with a bit of a cliche. Like, how, how did you start? How did Dead Monkey start? Was it always like a dubstep thing? Did you start it as being like, I'm going to do Dead Monkey, and it's going to be dubstep, or was it more like a natural kind of progression? It's just like whatever. Uh, no, I mean it definitely. Well, it started before there was dubstep, so cool. it, I started it in like 2006. So I guess I probably started it right when people were starting to make dubstep. But uh, yeah, I, I used to. I started DJing at rock climbing competitions because I worked at climbing gyms all the time. Cool. That was my day job. Yeah, I heard about that because I, I, I used to do quite a bit of climbing. Like my, my dad's really into it. I've, I've climbed in like Yosemite and stuff like that. Like pretty much oh, really? all the climbing, all the family holidays I ever went on as a kid were always climbing holidays. Oh, sick. That's awesome. I didn't know yeah, that. <laughs> so yeah, we'll have to go climbing, climbing, have to go climbing someday. Yeah, fuck yeah. Wow, that's tight. Yeah, that place is amazing. Yeah, man. I, I take it you've climbed there before. I have, yeah. Yeah, I went on one trip there. Is that what drew you to living in Colorado as well? Yeah. And I, I basically, like, I moved here when I was 19, and I had a job waiting for me at a climbing gym. So that's what kind of got me out here. And then I worked, like, I worked in climbing gyms full-time from the age of, like, 13 to 30. Nice. Mm. And then, uh, yeah, and then music started. So, where, where were you living before you lived in Colorado? Sacramento, oh, California. Okay, cool. Oh, nice. Yes. So, is it not, is, I guess it's a bit more flat down there. There's not as much climbing in, like, towards the coast. Yeah, kind of. I mean, you're in the valley, but it's, it is close. It is kind of close to everything. It's like, you know, an hour from Tahoe, which has a lot of climbing in the Sierras, cool. um, pretty close to Yosemite. But I never went to Yosemite until I moved here. Which is yeah, I think weird. when we when I was over there, we we flew into Denver and then kind of climbed our way all the way to like San Francisco and went to the stops in like Utah. We did like Grand Canyon and Yosemite and all that shit. It was pretty epic. Oh, sick. 
that's awesome. Yeah, it's, I mean, so that's where Dirt Monkey comes from, obviously. Nice. <laughs> Probably makes more sense now. Yeah, totally. And what? So, and you had that other radio, Steve Steve French, as well. Was that like an offshoot of that, or was that were you, were you uh, doing yeah, the that, house thing before, or you know? That was like when I. That was when I first started getting really into like tech house and stuff, and cool. I was like kind of messing around with that, you know, locally. Like, or I, I would play at like warehouse parties and stuff like that as Steve French, and nice. wear like a a dress coat and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, like, well, why don't I just do everything as Dirt Monkey? Like, yeah, that's kind of what I've. I mean. I don't know. I was going to say that's kind of what I do, but I have like a billion, a billion aliases. You've got so, like, so, so yeah. many aliases, Will. Like, so many. <laughs> Always <laughs> like, I got this song by this artist. And you're like, that's <laughs> me, actually. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think what, what, it, what it really comes down to, I mean, when, you, when, you, when I'm, there, there are certain sort of sounds and flavors where it's nice to kind of put on a different hat and do it and be more, have that kind of direction. But I think when it really comes down to it, your music is your music. It's not, it's not, it's not very easy to, like to make a song and it not sound like you. So mm-hmm. I think once you have your name and you're established, I don't think it really matters. Yeah, you know? for sure. And it is, it is more of like a, yeah, that's the reason I've always wanted to do it is cause I'm like, okay, if I do this, then people won't expect me to like, they won't want me to play any dubstep. Like I can just do whatever I want and like play an hour of deep house or something. Yeah, totally. I wish I wish it was a bit more. Accept- I mean, I say that I was gonna say I was gonna say I wish it was more acceptable to be a bit more like all over the place. But I think there's people that do it. I think it's more just like people are afraid to do it. I mean, that's kind of what this whole album is is a bit of an experiment to see like how people are gonna react to me doing something a bit different. Yeah, but I think as well as it being different, it's also kind of a bit more pure. It's just kind of like me doing just any electronic music with the funk element in it, rather than it being like me doing like get a phone call breaks or anything in particular. It's just kind of yeah. like my sound printed on some different tempos. And I think the longer you do that, the more your fans that you start to acquire, like they're just used to that. Cause yeah, I totally, I, for a while I was only making dubstep and like, you know, if I made anything else, it would be kind of weird to everybody. But then I don't know. I think I'm like three out al- three or four albums deep now with like multi genre stuff. So I feel like, I can get away with like whatever I want now. I can play like drum and bass for 20 minutes in my set. And yeah, dude, I think it's all about squeezing the DMB in there. We love that shit over here. Yeah. <laughs> you, can't, you, you don't have a set in Bristol without, without a bit of drum and bass. <laughs> it's funny in the U S it's like, it's been so hard to play drum and bass for so long. And now I feel like it's kind of catching on. I feel like it's the, becoming like the cool underground thing yeah, you know? yeah I, it's I, weird it's weird that like it's it's kind of the opposite over here with with dubstep like dubstep was like cool and underground when it first started and then it very quickly got americanized and i think that put a lot of people off and then yeah. drum and bass even mm-hmm. though drum and bass is kind of being americanized now anyway it's kind of cooler than ever i don't really get how it works like yeah. people are acting like it's this underground thing but drum and bass is pretty fucking established yeah, dr- right drum and bass is so mainstream and like i yeah. guess i guess like why like drum and bass like didn't really hit america first because like dubstep went over there and then you guys went crazy for it and it like became like this huge edm thing and there was just so much of that going on that no one really wanted anything any other influences from outside it was just like that that was the big thing like and that's why it's taken a while i guess to trickle over and now yeah i think so it, maybe is so that back over there not really. I mean, like we were going to say, like we were going to get to this later, but we we, we we've um yeah we saw Rusko quite recently in in Bristol, and he played right after Shy FX, and Shy FX was absolutely fucking round, and then Rusko went on, and it pretty much cleared out. Yeah, I mean, there's like half the people left again. in the main room, like. But like, yeah, if you compare that to like him playing in the states, it's it's pretty crazy, like the, the difference. And I think yeah. that's kind of why. <laughs> I don't know. I think I think me playing that the stuff that I've made on my album would kind of work. This, this is another thing that's such a shame about fucking no festivals this summer is I'm not I'm not going to be able to actually know the crowd reaction to my music for so <laughs> yeah. long, which uh, is like such a big part. Especially like it feels weird putting out a whole album of music and I haven't even road tested any of it. You know? Yeah. Well, but, I'm testing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think people. I think people would enjoy. I think. Yeah, like, like, like we were saying, I think with over here, the, the tact would more be like people being into my music and then I'm sneaking it in there. People wouldn't come and see me if I was like a dubstep artist. Right. I could like you slip it into my set. In. 
and people would li- love it, you know. You're like, hey, guys, remember this little dirty little secret that we all have together? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's the funny thing, too, is like when you, when, if you play like Cockney Fergus and it, people go nuts. Yeah, like people just lose their minds because uh, like it's that nostalgia thing, though. Everyone's like, "Holy shit, I remember this tune. It's so good." <laughs> yeah, I think it might also just be like a bit of like English imperialism, where it's like drum and bass is still ours, but the Americans <laughs> took the U- took dubsteps and fuck you. you know what I mean? like, <laughs> <laughs> well, also to be fair, drum and bass is just the best genre of music. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> Can't really deny that. <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely a lot of lot of tripe that, that's, that's coming out at the moment, but this it's still there's still yeah, just just when I lose faith in it a bit, I'll I'll hear another song and be like, Oh yeah, this is the shit. Like there's oh, been some, like I think um I'm dark. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, things going a bit cheesier has kind of put put more money in it, which has meant that people can get away with making crazier shit. So for like for every big commercial successful tune, there's like a whole other underground scene that's supported by it, you know, with drum and bass. Mm. Like people like Mephius and stuff probably wouldn't exist if it wasn't for like the really cheesy famous shit. Because you know, there's there's money in making this really obscure, weird technical stuff, which I don't think there really was before. Maybe. Yeah. Like you could have a legit, really successful career by making really weird dark shit basically. well and they those kind of artists get held up by like all the huge because you guys have those these like giant drum and bass festivals there like i've seen videos of crowds yeah. seen videos of you know like rampage yeah like rampage yeah. and let it roll they're huge i guess i guess Be- i guess boomtown as well like, yeah, but- the, like that stage is like the playing of the lion's den and stuff it, 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 i mean it's, i don't know it's weird like i feel like main stage festivals here it's not so much of a thing but it's it still is just like everywhere you go is drum and bass at UK festivals. Almost a bit too much. So it's like it's just it's hard to get away from it. <laughs> I'm, kind of, I'm kind of sick of it to be honest. Like I love the, I love the music, but I'm kind of bored of seeing it in a set. I mean, I don't mind like seeing someone play some of it, but the whole set of it or a whole night of it, I just get fucking bored of it. See what you're talking about is how I feel about house music here. Yeah, that's, 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 I, get, I get that a bit too. Listen to and it's cool, but it's like. It's exactly what you're saying. So, I think it's just when someone's playing like, like dubstep for the sake of playing dubstep or drum. You know what I mean? When when someone's yeah. like an artist in their own right and they have their own vibe and they love what they do, then cool, I don't care. But if it's yeah. just like, let's go to a house night, and it's like, it's just going to be shit because people don't care about, you know, they, once they're through the door, they're over it because they're not there right. for anything in particular. You know who has always held it down and like always mixes it up really well is Skrillex. Mm. That's totally true, man. He, he's been as much as people like to give him shit or whatever, or he seems like mainstream. Like he's he's yeah. he's like the Tony Hawk of EDM. Like, oh yeah, for the sport. He's uh, I feel like he's transcended shit talking too. Like I don't think I don't think anyone's hating on him. I don't think anyone can. I think mm. you're right. I think I think Tony Hawk was a good example because he's he was the same. Yeah, you know, people used to talk shit about him, but now people are like, oh, actually, all the guys who talk shit about him are now dead of drug overdoses, and Tony Hawk's <laughs> still smashing it. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of smashing so, it, well, should we um, should we play another track? Yeah, we probably should. Should we play Monkey Funk since that's our little date we yeah. made together? Yeah, might as well. Oh, you can play them there. You can play them there. A little VIP. Yeah, should we do that? Why not? Yeah, do that. <laughs> yeah, he hasn't even prepped it. <laughs> yeah, yeah smash the VIP on. I haven't even I haven't heard the VIP. I've listened oh, to the shit. album like ten times. Things up a little bit. I played it the other night and it went off. All right, all right, sweet. <laughs> Let's do it.
Yes, that was Monkey Funk VIP by myself and Patrick, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, say that again. Uh, nice work on that. I love that. I, lo- I love yeah, that switch one, up halfway through. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the tracks that like I just wish I could play out right now. Fuck, like I love yeah. I love playing transition tunes. It's always such a vibe. Yeah, it's such a good DJ tool to have too. Yeah, man, I'm all about those. So um, when did when did you start doing nineteen k? It was I feel like it was quite recent. It was a year ago. Yeah, yeah you, you seem exactly. to have quite, quite yeah. a lot of music in that time. Yeah, yeah, we've put out a bunch of music actually. I think yours is yours is the twentieth release. I think. Well, yeah, in a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's insane. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> So how, how did that come about? Was it was it kind of through putting wanting to put your own music out, or was it was it kind of a bit of both? Uh, like it was it was a bit of both. Yeah, it was partly like I don't know. I I just wanted to. I've I've always wanted to just curate my own little avenue of music and nice. Just create create a vibe, create like a little subculture within like dance music and all that. Yeah, man. That's kind of what we do with the Church of Love in a lot of ways, like especially in, in Bristol. I, I don't know, I don't, you, you probably don't know, but there's, there's, there's a Church of Love podcast. But the Church of Love started as like a as a, as a club night here in Bristol. Oh, and you okay. Like have like church decor and sexy nuns, and it's kind of like the anti, anti like we were saying about all these big drum and bass nights. Kind of we're like the anti that with like yeah. really che- cheesy, silly music and lots of cheesy, silly, good vibes all the way through. Yeah, lots of eclectic music, and it's all kind of just my friends and our circle playing a lot of the time and kind of a bit, a bit less about big headliners and more just about this vibe. But like you say, sort of curating your own little music scene, which is, which is yeah. fun, yeah. Yeah, it's fun doing that. So you guys had, so you had like, it was more of like a cheeky kind of kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, I mean like lots of really shit, like stupid remixes of like really cheesy songs made to drum and bass and like just a very tongue-in-cheek vibe and a bit more kind of like 
Yeah, I mean, you get like a lot of girls there and lot, like all yeah, ages. Like and... So many girls, like compared to other nights that you go to, like you go to a drum and bass night in Bristol and it's 90% guys. You go to one of our, our nights and it's just like mainly girls and it's just like, <laughs> it's just like, just lo- loads of people just come in for the fun. Like people turn up and not even knowing the lineup just because they want to come to a church of love night. It's great. That's awesome. That's, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's when, that's when you're really leaving a bit of a legacy too, isn't it? When you've got, when you're doing something beyond just yourself and like, Bringing, bringing other people into it and um, I think it, it can be quite lonely just doing the music thing on your own I think it's it's nice to be able to share that with people and take yeah. people on for the ride so I appreciate I appreciate you having me as part of the fam <laughs> oh yeah man I've dude I was like so pumped when I heard because I'm I'm so bad at like going out and listening to new music so when I heard your stuff I was like oh my god <laughs> you <laughs> awesome I love it Sweet. Yeah, I'm kind of the same. I mean, especially with like, I used to find a lot of stuff on SoundCloud and now since it's just kind of been swamped with crap and reposts and stuff, like I do find it, I don't know, I almost, most of the time I'm like, I'd rather just make another song than to spend hours trying to find, find new artists, you know? Yeah. There he is. Yeah, it just freaked out then. Like, like, um, I'm trying to think of a recent example, probably like Urban Dawn. You, you know Urban Dawn, don't you? Yeah. I think that's quite a good example of when I... I mean, we all heard that fucking come together remix and we're just like, whoa! So I do, <laughs> yeah. I do, I do, I do miss having those moments still, Like, but it is a bit harder to find. I think there's just so many people putting out music now. It's quite difficult to find the good shit. Yeah, and I and that's part of the reason I started 19K is because I, like, I follow Hospital religiously. So I... That, like that's where I hear about all the new music that cool. I end up getting into. So I wanted to create like my, you know, the more multi-genre version of Hospital. Like that's, yeah, that's cool. what I would like it to become eventually. Yeah, Hospital is kind of how I got into electronic music as well. Maybe like probably like fucking ten years ago now, when I was like first getting into. It. I mean, <clears throat> the first electronic music I really heard was like Aphex Twin and stuff like that, like the really weird IDM stuff. And then I got shown like. Net Sky and High Contrast and started following the hospital records and all, all, all the all the my first records for DJ and World German Bass records. Oh, okay. So that's yeah, hospital, I mean it was like around the time Danny Bird put out like Rave Digger. Oh yeah. So that was a big influence on as you can probably hear from my music, like yeah. Danny Bird's got that kind of cheekiness to it, but it's ah, still like mean. party and quite ravey. Yeah. Yeah, Danny Bird's the man. Another thing I was going to ask you about as well, actually, if, if we're talk, whilst we're talking about influences, is Rusko. You, you've, you've been making a track with Rusko, right? Yeah. That's yeah. definitely exciting. It's sick, yeah. It's, uh, and we, like, oh, man, I've been, I mean, I've kind of known him for a long time now. Like, he, he's he been, like, playing my tunes for a while. I'm trying to remember, like, at least five or six years. Nice. So I've, like, kind of been talking to him for a long time, and then... Yeah, I guess we've gotten a little closer over the last couple of years since he's like jumped back into, you know, into touring and all that. So, um, yeah, we've been talking about making a tune. We actually started another tune a couple of years ago and then it kind of just got, you know, kind of got lost, which happens sometimes. It happens. Yeah. And then, yeah, he hit me up out of the blue last week and was like, hey, do you want to make a song? Like, I have stems ready. I'll, I can send you stems right now or I, I can stem it out right now and send it to you. And he sent it to me and I like, I was like, clear my schedule. I'm going to the studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fuck yeah. I've got to do this. And then, yeah, it just came. I'll, I'll send it to you. Well, so you can hear it. Sweet. Yeah. I think um, that's the best way to go about it with tracks. I mean, there's definitely a lot to be said for like, you shouldn't, I think when you, when a track's too, too developed, it's kind of hard for someone to jump on it. But I think I think it's quite nice to strike one that iron is hot, so to speak, and be like, "Yo, here's a vibe, take it." Rather than like kind of like chatting about maybe doing a song and it just never really happens. It's like, yeah, I think you got to take the initiative sometimes. And, and it's it's funny because like I've always wanted to write dub, so, you know, like that reggae kind of dub. Mm. Um, like I, I'd like, man, I've always wanted to. I've I've always wanted to put an album out and then put out like that album in dub and just do all dub remixes of it. Mm. That's a really cool idea. It, it 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 is a cool idea. It would require cloning myself though. I think so <laughs> I don't know if it's ever gonna happen. I could but, help you out. I could help you out with that. I used I used to play in reggae and ska bands and shit. Oh okay. 
that was kind of how I got into music, really. I mean, especially like dance music was like, I mean, I, I say like drum and bass, but also like dub reggae. Like it, it's yeah. not really as much of a thing in the States and in Canada, but over here, you know, obviously sound system culture and yeah. drum and bass and stuff all comes from like reggae. And I've spent yeah. many, I've spent many a festival weekend just in reggae tents, skanking out, stoned off my tits for days. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's the best, man. It's just, yeah. there's like, something about it, man. It's like it's it's another level. There's like there's raving, and everyone's you know everyone's connected, and you and you're raving out. But then when it's kind of a bit mellower, and the bass is deeper, and it's a bit more intimate, there's just something about it, man. It's like such a fucking yeah. beautiful vibe. I mean, kind of what you're describing is what led to dubstep being created. Oh, for sure, yeah. But now it's kind of more about the impact of the drop than it is about just the general constant flow of energy, you know? Yeah. I think it's what's so special about those. Because then, then it's kind of, it's always at a high, so it can only go up. Like when yeah. there's a really special moment, it feels even more special. Whereas like with dance music, it's kind of like there's that lull in the breakdown and everyone's like waiting around, checking their phones kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the Rusko song though was cool because what he sent me was basically a, a dub song. Like it nice. was just... All, all the classic like dub like instruments and did stuff have, like did it have a dub siren in <laughs> uh, that's a pretty classic dub <laughs> no it did not it does not have a siren at all you've got, you've got to whack it in <laughs> hey, that's thing. I'll show you you'll see uh, but I did I, I do I bought my son I have a two almost three year old son um, I bought him a melodica oh, and nice. I brought I brought the melodica in here and recorded a melodica line to put on the outro just as like, nice. well, I thought you were going to say you bought him a dub siren then. I was like, that's <laughs> not, that's not a good idea. I'm getting an air horn for his third birthday. So. Yeah. Rusko was a fucking huge influence on me. Like watch that. I mean, I'm, we've all seen it. That classic fucking producer video of him, like in 2007 or some shit Yeah, on his shitty little computer. Yeah. Which must have inspired millions and millions and millions of people to just. Oh God, I went oh, yeah. I can buy an albino right when I saw that. Yeah, man, that's that's how I learned to make bases. Was, was on albino for. I, I was only using that for a long time. Everyone else was on massive. I was I was still sticking with albino for ages. That's Spectral Thirty Three. Oh shit! Yeah, Perfect. I tried to I tried to get it on um because because you, you, you can like what's it called? There's a way you can open it in sixty four bit, but it was just a bit sketchy. I need to just get the um wavetables for it somehow. Oh, right. Yeah, that would be cool to get the wavetables and Zoom and Serum or something. Yeah, I've got all the massive wavetables in Serum, so there must be a way you yeah. can do it. Man, I've just I, I've just gone back to only using Massive now. Nice. I don't know why. It's just, yeah, it's just kind of fun, like, going through phases. Yeah, that's kind of what how I um, approach it. Same, same with switching around genres, too. I think if you just make the same music and make it in the same way all the time, then you, you're obviously going to get stuck or get bored. Like, you've got to keep it fresh somehow. Yeah, I, be, I mean, before before I did all this, the, the this album here, which is obviously all pretty heavy bass music, I was pretty much just writing loads of, like original boogie eighties disco funk stuff with like no bass lines, no big kicks and snares. I was just like so bored of doing bass music. I just kind of like had this like few months where I was just making super chill stuff. Yeah, and, and then, so then by the time it came to making this, I was like really excited to make some heavy stuff. And I think I might, I think I might actually put that stuff out after this album just to kind of like balance things out a bit. Like have a really heavy bass music album and follow it with like this really cheesy disco album. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Why the fuck not? Yeah. Yeah, Rusko is actually the reason I went to Leeds College of Music as well. That's where I, I studied uh, music production college was Leeds College of Music. Um, oh, okay. And they kind of they kind of sold it as like, oh yeah, Rusko came here, but he actually got kicked out because he, he just made tunes all the time. And like really? never showed up. And that's basically what almost happened to me as well. Like anyone that's like actually good at music doesn't need to fucking go to college. And right. Like, it's, it's like, like I'd rather be at home making shit than like go in and then like I've like already learned the shit they're telling me on YouTube. You know what I mean? It's like a mechanic pointless. that goes to mechanic school and they fail because they're too busy fixing other people's cars. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I don't, I don't regret it though. It's, it's definitely good to just, it's more about just having three straight years of thinking about nothing but music. Not so yep. much about the cost, but just the mindset, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I've always wondered, uh, I don't know, I've always wondered about the, the music schools, especially like the electronic music specific ones, you know, like I think, what is it, Icon? Icon? Yeah, I, feel, I feel like they would be better. Like the one I went to, it was more filtered through a traditional university program so i was, I was like yeah. 
it was a music college, so there's people studying classical music and jazz music, and like production was kind of like the dirty subject almost, even though we had the most students. And it wasn't like the the, the, the jazz course and the and all, all the courses were so high standard, but the production course was a bit less. Like they were just kind of letting anyone in by the time I I was there, and yeah. I just didn't feel like I was learning that much. I mean, it, it, they focus more on songwriting, which is which is more important really, but. Some of, some of the kind of more electronic specific ones where you're actually learning how to compress things and how to mix a bit more. That was kind of more what I wanted to do, but it was a bit, it was a bit more kind of theory based. But like yeah. I say, I think that stuff's important too. I think when it comes to music production with like electronic music, most of it's like training your ears and practice. You can't really like just tell someone this is how you do it and then they just do it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. I'm going to watch a video of like, how to make a good kick and then you make good kicks for the rest of your life. Yeah, exactly. It's not that easy. Um, yeah. but, I mean, but in terms of songwriting, you can tell someone like the methods to use to write songs, but it, I mean, it's all, it is all fucking practice and it is all subjective. And that's what I find so exciting about it is like, there's always more to learn. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I, Angus has been, um, trying to, trying to teach me a lot at the moment. Um, him and Howler said the next production session we have, I'm in the hot seat and I've got to do everything, which, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is going to be interesting. Um, yeah. If you didn't know, Patrick, I've, um, recently started producing music with Angus, who is the other half of Tuxedo Junction, which is one of Will's other aliases. Oh, yeah. okay. Um, and we've just been making like, we're sick of like all the really serious drum and bass. So we've just been making some really stupid drum and bass. And I like, <laughs> it's been getting out of hand with how silly they've been because I come up with all the ideas and then sort of put an idea down on the sort of Ableton timeline and then Angus kind of like we sit there and make it better and then by the end of it it's like God what have we created but they're <laughs> they're, they're, they're great tunes they're just <laughs> great. yeah bit bit crazy yeah, we need that we need that kind of stuff right now especially right now <laughs> yeah totally man I think like it, it, it does feel kind of weird putting, putting out music at the moment with everything going on, but I think yeah. at the same time, I mean, I think, I mean, the main thing is like the actual music itself. It's important that we have that. I think it's just like the promotion side of it is what feels weird. Like, yeah. Like trying to like kind of, sh- I don't know. I j- just, I mean, it's, it's fake enough as it is most of the time, but right now it kind of feels a bit insensitive, but at the same time, like I say, we do we do need music. Yeah, for sure. And it's, you know, like at some point, yeah, we got to keep, pushing our stuff and like people need that people need to hear new music and um i don't know i think people need to be able to like go to shows and like be with each other and just yeah i I think that's quite uh, yeah it's uh, obviously it's a bit of a everyone's got different opinions on it but i think certainly in terms of like the longer like repercussions of what's happening I think the mental health part of it is quite a bit, quite important too, in terms of like, you know, people, you know, people being isolated, people not being able to be together. It's like, that's yeah. like, obviously COVID's fucking sketchy and deadly as well. But I think there's also long-term repercussions to that, like not being able to be with people. And especially if you're like living on your own right now and stuff. Or if, Oh man. Yeah. Anyone that's like single. Yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, at least I mean I, I'm married to the music man so I got, I got, I got that <laughs> but some people don't you know some people don't have shit to do when they're at home like yeah, I'm, when I'm at home I'm in my element but like a lot of people that you know it must be pretty fucking crazy I mean it's hard for everybody like it's, it's just, it was hard for us with like a two year old and yeah but you know the two year old's like a whole different thing I mean understand like what's going on uh, not really. No. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it's probably for the best because like, that's another thing that kind of it's quite a weird prospect. Is like a, 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 some of these kids going to be kind of like scarred for life in terms of like not like in their formative years being told not to touch people and stay away from people. Like, are they going to be are they going to be freaked out like that forever? Like, dude, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, we we've we, we don't make our son like social distance. Cause they're, it's weird. There's, there's some parents that are like, okay. to their two or three year olds. They're like, all right, make sure you stay six feet away from the other two year olds. And then they're like, well, I don't know what you just said. I'm just going to go play with these kids. <laughs> I'm like, they need that. Well, also, I mean, kids aren't the ones like spreading it to each other. So there's yeah, I that. guess it's, it's, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how it is over uh, for you guys, but over here, it's it's there's been very little guidance. 
of like what how to fucking actually deal with this stuff you know no one's no one's really told us like yeah to, like how, how parents should be acting and then, like, like my mum's my a teacher mm. and she's actually had to go back to school and she's you know they're, te- they're, they're teaching like quite young kids and like just they've been so vague about it. it's basically up to the school to like work it all out and like yeah. you know if someone gets really sick or something happens like it's up to them and it kind of falls back on them when it, when it should be the government should really have been fucking a bit more clear about what the fuck was, was going on we, we don't fucking know what's going on Everything, everything's supposed to be opening up again on friday mm-hmm. and on the day the album comes out and everyone's gonna be down the pubs oh. and shit but i don't know i don't i don't really know how i feel about it all i mean i think i don't know it depends how people are and uh, but I, I think um I think I'm going to wait for it to die down a little bit first. I mean, how, how are they doing it over there in terms of the shows? Is it is it is there some kind of like guidelines implemented and yeah, like, it's, if every state is completely different though. Like if you okay, you'd kind of have to look at the United States as like Europe, like how you would look at all of Europe, where each country yeah. is doing its own thing. Mm. Yeah, um, exactly. So like Colorado, where I live, is a lot different than Texas. Texas. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. I, like they have shows going on. There's there's like big shows happening right now too. There's I heard about some country singer that just did a show for like four or five thousand people mm. in the last few days, which is kind of crazy. And I've been doing some shows. I've played two shows inside of clubs, um, but it's you know it's very like strict, like masks. Like you you can't force people to wear masks here. But it's like definitely pushed on everyone, mm. um, and then they they take everyone's temperature before they come in the club. Okay, well, that, that that's probably quite a, quite a big part of it as well. But, it, but it's weird because like I I played in St. Louis a few nights ago, and it's super low capacity. It's like a thousand person club with one hundred people in there. So there's you know it looks like it's kind of weird because it looks like you're playing to an empty room. Yeah. <laughs> It was sold out, which was like kind of strange. But there were people like smoking cigarettes in the club. And I was like, <laughs> you guys not get the whole memo about the like coronavirus thing and the <laughs> respiratory so system? Uh, like our government does not talk about um, our immune system. Yeah. yeah, it's the same here. Like everyone's kind of. Yeah, it's kind of about how to stop the spread of it, but not necessarily how to be like ready for it when it hits you. Because at the end of the yeah. day, I'm pretty sure we're all going to get it at some point. That's kind of how a pandemic works. Uh, or our immune system is going to fight it off. That's we true, but yeah, you know I mean, like we, we, we're going to be a carrier of it at some point. So we yeah. might as well, we might as well be learning how to be ready for it and be healthy. You know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, nobody talks about that. It's because there's no money in that. That's true. There's not like a single person that's selling like vitamin d or whatever <laughs> right yeah i was joking about how i should start selling vitamin d at the merch booth <laughs> <laughs> yeah why not <laughs> we were joking about doing some like church of love ecstasy pills at one point but then i was like if, if they were really if, if they're really good to the point where someone ripped them off and then like someone died of like a sketchy church of love pill i would feel so bad <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. The long game on that one doesn't look too good. <laughs> no, it doesn't, does it? <laughs> right, we should probably have some more music, hey? Yeah, we should. <laughs> so um, I was going to play, I think I, I'll play that, my track, Biaka, which I've not actually played, at anyone's, I don't think anyone's heard yet. And this I've is kind it. of the, when we were um, talking about Rusko and all that kind of shit, this, this is very much inspired by that kind of vibe. So um, yeah, let's have that. Yeah, sick, man. Thank you. 
Cool, cool. That was my track, Biaka, from my album, Funk Step, which is out soon or out now. Who knows when this comes out? Yeah, it's, de- it's definitely got that Rusko vibes, but it's definitely still 100% Father Funk. <laughs> See, this is what I was saying before, you know, you can't, you can't really escape your sound no matter how hard you, how hard you try. Well, should we have, should, well, I think we should probably have the news. Hey, I didn't, let me just, uh, I need to get the news, news music. Where is it? <laughs> yeah. The there news. Yeah, the news. Every pod, you're in for a treat, Patrick. Every podcast, we've got the news. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> This week in the news, humpback whale's 10-foot penis captured in a once-in-a-lifetime fo- photo off the coast of Sydney. Yes. A sex-mad tortoise who saved his entire species with it <laughs> from extinction has retired. <laughs> Witches and Satanists have teamed up with leftists to destroy America. <laughs> <laughs> Stoned sheep cause mayhem in Swansea Valley after eating cannabis plants... <laughs> Married couple waiting for children didn't know that they needed to have sex to have children. <laughs> um, New York City just remember, uh, sorry, New York City just recommended using glory holes in latest pandemic advice. <laughs> uh, and finally, uh, a man was found with a whole fish stuck in his rectum uh, after sitting on it by accident. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was the news. And that was the news. Wow, some very fruity stories this week. <laughs> I'm just glad I know what's going on now. <laughs> yeah, I feel nice and up to date. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, um, we, we were going to ask, I mean, we kind of already touched on the drum and bass thing already, but um, I was, I was going to ask you kind of, I mean, since, since it's, it's not so much of a thing in the States, what, what, what was it that kind of got you into it and drew, and drew you into it in the first place? Um... I don't know. I mean, I guess I just, I just liked it from the, from the get go, like right when I heard it for the first time. How, how did you come across it? Was it like through UKF and stuff? No, it was, uh, I heard it. So that when I started throwing shows in Boulder back in like 2007 or something, um, I was throwing, I was playing, I was DJing all like breaks, like new school breaks kind of stuff. And, uh, I had a, I had a twice every other week, you know, night there at this like small bar and the alternating night, it was Tuesdays. So I had every other Tuesday and then this other guy, um, had all the other Tuesdays and he had a drum and bass night. And then I started going to those and I was like, Ooh, I like this stuff now. (laughs) (laughs) And then we actually combined forces and, um just put our nights together and um yeah he's that this is my friend tom who also goes by shank aaron who's you know one of my best friends i've cool. you know cool. been pretty tight since but that's how i got into drum and bass nice was it was it much is it much of a kind of jungle scene over there as well or was it more just drum and bass um it's more it's definitely more drum and bass not not as much jungle it's kind of hard it's kind of hard to get people into jungle here like, yeah I, f- I feel like that's quite a very quite a um similar to grime it's like quite a british thing like it's not yeah. really i don't know if you'll ever get make it that like properly make it overseas like i, I mean in canada they act like they, they act like they like jungle but really it's just like ed solo <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, right, that's, yeah that's that's not jungle you <laughs> know what i mean like, no no offense to ed solo <laughs> but do palatable yeah jungle. That's rugged drum and bass. That's what I, I love. Is. Solo. Actually, the first, the first song that ever got me like hooked, fully hooked on dubstep was "Age of Dub" by Ed Solo. Nice. Hey. I actually have. You know, I was I was saying before about my first records for drum mix drum and bass were <coughs> drum and bass records. One of them was uh, Ed Solo remix. I think I think King of the Bongo. Mm. Oh remember, yeah, if I remember rightly. Yeah, classic. I think that needs a remake. Actually, that'd be cool. Yeah, let's do. Sweet. Well, yeah, I think it would. I think we'd be doing um, uh, a disservice if we didn't didn't go talk about the real shit that's going down in the states right now, uh, following the murder of George Floyd and all that serious business. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really know where to start, but I guess, I mean, we're, we're, we're kind of, I mean, we, we act like we're far removed from it over here. I mean, we, we obviously have our own problems, but it's quite hard to really know what's going on over there because we're so far removed from it and the, the media has been quite, you know, weird about reporting on stuff. But how, how close is that to you? Is that, is that, you know, within your vicinity in terms of where you live? Um, not, not exactly where I live, but I mean, I live pretty close to Denver and there's, there's been a lot of that. That was a, like a hot spot for like a lot of the, you know, stuff that turned into like rioting and all that, um, and protests. And yeah, it's just been like, it's crazy. It's just a crazy time. Like yeah, I think that stuff's been happening. That stuff's always been happening. Like there's always been police brutality. Um, mm-hmm. and the media is really good at like, skirting over it and being like all right yeah that thing happened let's move on to like the kardashians or something yeah something else for everyone to be you know pay attention to but i think since everyone's been cooped up for the last three months yeah it's harder to hide it all isn't it yeah like it just erupted and it needed to like no totally well, yeah, I think I think I think as well. Like, I guess people, it's easy to to control people more with like Fox News and all that shit. But when it, everyone's locked inside, you're not really watching the news as much. You probably watch on Facebook more than you know. You know what I mean? You probably yeah. the the, me, the um the media streams you pay attention to are a bit less malleable at the moment. You know what I mean? Yeah, and the, and all the media, like all of our mainstream media, is just garbage. Like, see, mm. to me, CNN and Fox News are the exact same thing. They're just like one of them is pushing the Republican party and one of them is pushing the Democrat party. Mm. And I've just, I feel like all this stuff, at least in the U S is like, we're, like we're being divided. We've always been divided and yeah. it's being used to like, like even the coronavirus stuff is being turned into like, it's being turned into a political thing yeah. where well, yeah, it's, it's the same here, man. Like the kind of, I mean, not, not so much in terms of like party versus party, but they're definitely, putting the responsibility on on us as the public rather than on them like for fuck's sake they've totally fucked it here in the uk it's so bad but they're making it out like like the, you know people are on all on the beach and like, oh look at these idiots and it's like well no one actually told those guys not to go to the beach like as much as it's it might be silly and irresponsible what's silly and irresponsible is that they weren't told not to do that you know what i mean you can't blame you know a family of fucking four to go for going down to the beach on a hot day when they're all cooped up inside with the screaming kids or whatever when it, like they're going to do that unless they're told not to do that. Yeah. And that's yeah. what's scary about these big, you know, these big events is like just seeing how they use them to their advantage. You know, it's kind of fucked up. But I mean, it seems like in the States, from what I can see, people are mostly on the right side of it. But I don't know. Is, is, is there been much backlash in the opposite direction kind of thing? For like shows and stuff? Well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm more mean in, the, in like the Black Lives Matter thing. Like, is, is, is it, I feel like is it, it, people are mostly agreeing on the fact that it needs to be reformed. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yeah, everyone agrees. Um, it, it is... Everyone agrees, I think, that there needs to be police reform. Um, but now it's starting... Like, you know, at first everyone was like, defund the police, get rid of the police. Because um, they're, they're all, like, terrible. And I agree that all the whole police system needs to be reformed, but I'm not sure if like defunding it is the right move Mm. because then it's like, yeah, I found, I found it something something crazy the other day that um, the American police, like when you like, you only have to do like a fraction of the amount of training that you do over here in like the UK to get on the street and start doing it. And there's a lot of training that the police get over in America that is really focused at like, you know, detaining someone and like controlling them. Whereas over here, it's like that you get three, three, four years of training. And a lot of it is like, um, diffusing situations and like yeah. making sure that violence never happens. I mean, we still have pr- police brutality over here, but like, you know, the, the police are a lot better trained. So, I mean, like, you know, maybe defunding over, over your ways isn't the best way because maybe put more funding into their training, have them in training for longer, have them in training like for like four or five years. And like yeah. really, you know, I think the problem though is that it's such a deep rooted issue that like to really get to the core of these things and really change things, it does kind of take fucking things up big time. Like, mm. you know what I mean? It's like the same with, same with systemic racism. It's like, it's been around for so long and our whole society is built on it. it mm-hmm. You can't, it, 
if, if we want to, if we really want to change things fast, which you know it's not going to be fast, but if we want to speed things up, it does have to be something extreme like that. You can't yeah. just kind of keep hoping for the best and like, you know what I mean? It, 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 this this great racism is built into these societies, and it's, and especially the police, which you know is is very predominantly started on the, you know like like people people from the KKK were in the police and stuff for a long time. That's probably still going on. You know, right. what I mean, like d- disproportionately, like, disproportionately so. I, I think, I think, like, yeah, there definitely needs to be a lot more screening of people like getting in, and I think there needs to be a lot more like checkups on cops, mm. and like, yeah, you know, every month maybe, maybe there's like a psychiatrist or like a therapist or somebody like on every police force that maybe this happens already. I don't know, but just something to like be able to check in and be like, Hey, how you doing? You know, I know you saw your partner get shot the, the other day. Um, you know, are you, how's that? Cause here's the thing. Yeah. Like if you get pulled, I've been, I've had numerous encounters with cops that have mostly been like, they're just assholes. And I'm like, so I've, I've, I get why everyone's like, fuck the police. Like they're always just mad. They always have a chip on their shoulder, but it kind of makes sense if they're like going through all this shit all the time, just day after day, like especially in ghettos and in places where like, there's a lot of like real violent crime going on daily, then it builds up and it gives them this like PTSD that just like, you know, it, they're just ready to explode. Mm. That's, that's what I think should, if we can. Yeah, I think, I think that's why there needs to be, like not maybe not defund the police completely but maybe just not put as much money into it and then have like a separate kind of policing kind of thing that like deals more with like domestic disputes and like mental mental health people and like you know what i mean so it's not like everything is like met with like brute force all the time you right. know so that, so, so that when, when you see the police you know that it's serious and like they're not just like because that's the worst thing with the police is like when you feel like you're being treated like a murderer when all you've done is something that's not remotely close to a murder, right? So when everyone's being treated with the same brutal force, it, that's what that's what makes people pissed off at them. But if there was like a bit more separation between different issues and maybe the people that are like regularly on the scene are more like approachable people. Yeah, or teaching the police how to be approachable people, like a but, you know like a yeah, cop that's true. Up, in, instead of a cop showing up being like aggressive maybe they could start out so for instance if i was like doing something i wasn't supposed to do and a cop came up to me and he was like hey hey how you doing is everything okay over here that would be a lot different of a story than like <laughs> him running over he's like get out of the car now yeah. <laughs> it's like jim jim carrey with like a little muppet like hey patrick <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe you want to put that joint down yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's what we need. Police with police with sock puppets. Straight. <laughs> we've sold we sold it, guys. <laughs> yeah, get rid of the white, get rid of the guns, <laughs> sock puppets. Yeah. That'll solve every situation. Fund the fund the socks. Fund <laughs> the socks. Oh, well, um, while we're on that to- on that topic, um, <coughs> you, you, re- sh- sh- uh, you recently um raised a bunch of money, didn't you, for putting out your Chrisatronics remix? Yeah, yeah. That's pretty uh, rad. Raised like 11,000, a little over okay. 11,000. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, can, is, that, is that still something that people can get hold of? Or? Uh, no, I closed it. Fair play. Uh, just because it was, it was a lot of work, like going through every email. And, yeah, I bet. And it was, it was a good, like, it was cool to see how much we could raise in like a week. So, yeah, man. Yeah. Well, should, we, um, should we play it? Is that cool? Yeah, sure. Do you have it? Yeah, I do have it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Sweet. Boom. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Subtronics and Grizz. Grizztronics, Dead Monkey Remix. Let's have it. in 
different. Electronics Dead Monkey Remix. What that was up? sick. <coughs> yeah, so yeah, nice, man. whilst we're on the uh, the subject of banging exclusives, <laughs> yeah, so, got to check out this cheeky dub plate I found down the back of the sofa. This one is uh, <laughs> it's a heater. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for this. Well, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you didn't, did you? <laughs> I did. I know it's coming. That was one of the best ones yet, Well, <laughs> Oh, yeah. That was definitely a good one. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a tradition we have on the Church of Love here with uh, hunting down Mr. Happy Bootlegs. 
I, I got a little something I want to play for you guys. Oh yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. You might have to if you if you if you share your screen, and then um, share your computer sound. <laughs> so I'll can stop. I, can, I just, can I send you the link real quick? Yeah, just then, do that. Just do yeah, that. Send yeah, it. Yeah. Send it to well. Um. Yeah, I think you guys will like it. Oof. I think it's gonna go over well. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you the link on Facebook, and then we'll oh. be done. But, still, still hurting a little bit from that banger. <laughs> yeah, well, this one's this one might hurt a little bit too. So, oh, yeah, just give me a minute. <laughs> Whew, a little bit out of breath after that. Yeah. We're, we're talking about doing an entire mixtape of all the Mr. Happy bootlegs that we've, we've made for the podcast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so like, every single drop is just Mr. Happy. Yeah, <laughs> I, th- I think I think we must have like ten or eleven Mr. Happy bootlegs that we've made. <laughs> 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 oh dear. Ah, <laughs> oh, like Joe's made a couple. Me and Angus have made one or two, and then you've made like five or six, maybe more now. Will. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here we go. Do you want to do you want to give us a little intro, Patrick? What have we got to say about this? No, I just play it. <laughs> no intro needed. Cool. Snow, bro. That's a heater. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, I actually saw uh, Rick, Rick Astley play um, at Isle of Wight Festival this time last year. He was fucking amazing. He, he, he oh, wow, really? Yeah, at the end of his set, he got up on the drums and fucking played uh, Highway to Hell. It was fucking, it was pretty badass. Wow. Now yeah. I just have like a real deep respect for Rick Astley. <laughs> yeah. Fuck yeah. Well, yeah, I guess we should start wrapping up soon. Um, I was going to play, we, we, we always play a, a track that's been sampled in like a classic classic track. Like a lot of the stuff I, I make is quite sample based. And obviously we all use break beats and stuff like that. So I, I, I quite like slipping in a bit of bit of culture in there. And um, I thought this, that this time I would play um, uh, It's My Thing by Marva Whitney, which um, was, was sampled in uh, Fuck the Police by NWA, which I thought was appropriate for this episode. Oh, okay.
So that was Martha Whitney, It's My Thing, sampled in Foot the Police by NWA. Cool, yeah, I think we should probably start wrapping up soon. I don't, I don't want to keep you too long, but, um, yeah, I mean, what, what, what have you got coming up? Are you, you're working on another album at the moment, right? Yeah, yeah, I think I'm done with it. Oh, already? <laughs> Sick. I mean, I've been, I've been like, I, basically, I, I've had, like, 15 songs um, that I wanted to put on it, and then I've narrowed it down to like 10 i think mm. nice um because i just didn't want to wait for wait waiting waiting for vocals and all that kind of takes a while so yeah totally yeah. Did, 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 you, did you ever do anything with that ravey one i sent you oh yeah i did actually i i started working on it on a twitch stream oh nice yeah i, I forgot to tell you it was like late late at night <laughs> Sweet. Working on collab. but um yeah, I, I did a bunch of stuff in albino with it. Oh, oh yeah, the old favorite. Nice. Yeah, I wrote a little wonky albino bass line for it. I'll, I'll have to back in it and see. Sweet. Yeah, you'll have to send it over. And um, I, I was going to say, I mean, what about what shows? I guess you're still dipping in and out of doing some random shows here and there, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing, um, yeah, just small, you know, really low capacity shows. Um, I'm doing two nights in a row in Minneapolis. Um, at this, yeah, at this venue that I always play at, but in a smaller room with like not very many people. Cool. And of course, there's the album coming out on 19K. Um, but is there anything else on 19K coming up we should be looking out for? Um, well, I mean, obviously your album, which is out by the time this comes out, right? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then. Yeah, there's we have some other like just random singles. Uh, there's a there's a man like probably my favorite drum and bass song right now called "Heavy" by uh, Sobo with okay. on vocals. I play it like all the time on all my live streams and all that. Yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll have to send that over because um, I'm trying to me and Angus are trying to build a bit of a mix at the moment to put out on SoundCloud, and I want loads of fresh, new, sexy music in it. Oh yeah, I'll send it over for sure. I'm I'm waiting. Uh, it, it just went out for mastering, so as soon as I get it, I will cool. uh, share it. And then um, another song, another really good one by my friend Mport. Um, it's kind of like a Ivy Lab type vibe. Oh, oh sick! Uh, Ivy Lab are fucking insane. I mean, I kind of like. I almost don't really get a lot of their music, but I respect it. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I, I, can, I can imagine just seeing... I mean, I don't think I have seen them play live, but seeing that at, like, Shambhala would just be, like, next level. Oh, yeah. And then uh, this other artist called Toy Box, who's making, like, really cool, almost tippery kind of stuff. Like, nice. For Jade Cicada kind of vibe. Cool. So, yeah, and then... I don't know. We'll see what else after that. Science. Cool, man. Well, I guess we've got, we've got one more question. How many yeah. monkeys would it take to kill an elephant? To kill an elephant? Yeah. yeah. Are the monkeys trained in like jujitsu or anything? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I guess. But... I mean, I guess you know you can just you can decide. I mean, I mean, how how long are you going to take to train them? Do you know jujitsu? <laughs> These are your monkeys. <laughs> okay. See, these are questions we need to be asking right now. <laughs> I think I think the more untrained, the more aggressive. <laughs> yeah. Surely. So right. the less you would need. Yeah, I think one monkey with a pocket knife attached to his hand. <laughs> <laughs> what, you duct tape it to his hand, just like wrap it around and the monkeys... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, if you leave him in there long enough. <laughs> give him a Red Bull or something. Give him some, you know, give him an espresso. <laughs> give him a little helicopter with a blade on the end. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> well, yeah, th thanks, so much for, thanks so much for joining us, man. Yeah, th thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. That was fun. Yeah, it was nice to finally uh, uh, meet, so to speak. Yeah. Sweet. Uh, yeah, well, I guess it's time for a pants down party, isn't it, Aiden? Yeah, it is. I've been, I've been Father Funk. I've been Aiden. And this has been the Church Love Podcast. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> don't worry, Patrick, you don't have to join in. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for watching hope you enjoyed that make sure you like comment subscribe all that shit if you enjoyed it and we'll see you next time peace